Thank you, dear Marco. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. And uh, you. I, I, I apologize for this uh, technical failure. And uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce, and especially Marcos and Alexandra for always being there for us and for Greece, of course. You know, as a diplomat, people often think of my life as an endless wine tasting experience. That's <laughs> <laughs> Marco. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something. Uh, which I can assure you is far away from real life. Although uh, I have to accept that in my career, I have been uh, fortunate enough to have tasted some of our country's finest wines. My mission here is to make even more Americans understand what I'm talking about. And uh, you are contributing to that uh, sec very successful. Coming to our day's event, I realized that it is difficult to speak about taste in a webinar, of course. How do you explain the, the sensation of flavor uh, through the screen? It is quite challenging. Nevertheless, um, apart from the experience of taste, it is very important that we keep and enhance the knowledge of this very industry we need to know the merits of our own Greek products, as well as the potential, the huge potential of our winemaking industry. The facts, uh, Marco and dear friends, speak for themselves. Greece, our country, is one of the oldest wine producers in the world. We know that, mm -hmm. we just need to advertise it a little bit more to the world. We are also one of the most competitive players in Europe, but that is never enough in the globalized wine trade. Wine exports is an industry worth of uh, around $36 billion, and European countries have uh, around three quarters of the market's global share. Availability, quality, and price will continue to define our place in the international market. We score pretty well in most categories, but we haven't been good enough in making a considerable impact in this market. The United States is the largest consumer of wine products, the largest importer, and the fourth largest producer. For decades, Greek wine had been absent from this market, unfortunately and not only from uh, the racks of high-end restaurants, but the shelves of average wine shops as well. And we know that very well because we have seen the progress made in, in the meantime. So uh, we have seen that uh, has changed, although there is still plenty of room for improvement. Americans, our friends, are now starting to become familiar with our own varieties, although I have to admit it will be very intriguing to see a customer pronouncing Agiorgitico, for example. Έτσι, Μάρκο, για πες το εσύ. Agiorgitico. Bravo. So we are off to a good start in terms of publicity as well. More and more wine critics and uh, connoisseurs uh, write about Greek indigenous varieties, often recreating beautiful images of the serene Mediterranean landscape. Closing my remark, dear friends, I would like, first of all, to thank the uh, commercial uh, office of uh, the consulate here in New York, and especially Georgos Mikhailidis and Vasilis Liveris, who are doing a tremendous job and uh, I would say that uh, if we wish to appeal to the wine world, we need to think in the same way we cultivate our grapes. You can never go straight to harvesting. First you plant, then you grow, and only in the end you reap the benefits of your efforts. It takes time, but it is the safest way to build quality and endurance. And you know, uh, they say, this is my last word, uh, uh, because I don't want to take your time, 
they say the wine, the vine, sorry, is extremely adaptable to new environments. I'm sure our winemakers will prove equally resilient. I'm pretty sure about that. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Kutras. Um, I'd like to now ask uh, Trade Commissioner Mikhailidis to say a couple words. Of course. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> I am very glad for that because we had a, uh, a few issues with uh, with my audio a couple of days ago. So, yeah. Um, Actually, uh, there are a couple of things that I'd like to say as far as the Greek export, the Greek wine exports to the U.S. are concerned. Um, the things that I want to point out are the following. Um, for a very long period of time, Greek producers, Greek wine producers were trying to compete in the global market mm -hmm. by producing and promoting international varieties, as for example, Chardonnay, Sauvignon, Pinot Grigio, so forth, so on. And it was almost uh, like 10, 15 years ago that they realized that you cannot compete with this kind of um, uh, mainstream varieties in the global market because you actually, you're not ac actually um, putting something new into the market. You cannot compete in these varieties, for example, with the French or the Chileans or the Argentinians or the Australians. So it was like 10, 15 years ago that Greek producers realized that um, they have to promote in the global market, into the, into the U U.S. market in particular, the indigenous Greek varieties. And it was at that point that they started launching um, specific... Um, they started launching specific... Uh, they, they, they launched an effort to cultivate these new indigenous... Uh, wine uh, varieties in Greece, as for example, uh, um, Asirtiko, Ayorgitiko, as the Consul General said, uh, Mavrodafni, uh, Nemea, so forth, so on. That was the one thing, because we realized that you have to bring something new into the market. You have to, to actually attract the global consumer, be it the American consumer or the Canadian consumer or the Australian or the Chinese or the Chinese or whatever cons consumer to try something new, to try something that will genuinely remind him of Greece. And this is the reason why they started this effort. And now we've reached the point that most of the, I would say that most of the Greek wines that are exported globally are of indigenous species, indigenous varieties. That's one thing. And uh, the other, uh, one other thing that I'd like to say is that um, there are uh, a couple of promotional campaigns for Greek food and Greek wines that are in progress right now in the U.S., but I can say with great confidence that the most successful of all by far is the one involving Greek wine. It is, this, um, it is a, a promotional campaign that has been going on for the last eight years or so. The name of, of the campaign is um, wines of Greece, that's the name of the campaign. It is being implemented by the uh, so-called EDOAO, Ethniki Diepagilmatiki Organosi Abelu Keinu Elados, for the Greek speaking among us, which is actually the uh, association of Greek wine producers of Greece. And they have been making these tremendous efforts for the last uh, almost eight years that they ha the campaign has been going on. And we, uh, there are we get, I would say, positive results out of this, but I can say that there's also a lot of room for improvement. Now, what do I say? What do I mean by saying that? I'd like to point out to certain figures to substantiate what I'm talking about. Uh, the good thing is that we have been witnessing a steady growth in the volume and value of Greek wine exports to the U.S for the last, I would say, five years or so. Um, to be more specific, wine exports, the value of Greek wine exports to the US amounted to almost 11 and a half million euros um, in uh, 2015. And now this, this value has reached the um, 15 million euros mark. This, uh, this constitutes a rise by almost 27%. So in the last five years only, 
we have witnessed an increase in the Greek exports of almost 27%. 27%. This is a good result. On the other hand, we also have to point to the fact that unfortunately, the share of Greek wine exports to the US remains very limited, taking into consideration the steady rise in the overall consumption, overall wine consumption to the US. Right now, um, uh, the total value of uh, wine imports in the US is almost 6 billion euros. 42 per 45 to 50 percent of which is French wine. So the French wine it actually dominates the US market as far as the imports are concerned. I'm not talking about local production, which is pr uh, primarily based in California, in Napa Valley. But as far as the imports are concerned, is uh, the French imports actually dominate the market. And then you have the wines from uh, Italy, almost 25 percent. And then other major players like, for example, New Zealand, Australia, and Chile. Um, unfortunately, the percentage of the we Greek wines uh, in the overall picture of uh, uh, wine imports in the U.S. is very, very limited. It was, it, it has been growing, but it's still very limited. To be more specific, the overall um, uh, market share, the, the market share in the overall wine imports in the U.S. was only 0.17% in 2007. And 10 years later, in 2017, it was only 0.23%. So in, in a 10 years period, it grew from 0.17 to 0.23%. So it actually depends whether we want to see the glass half full by saying that we have been witnessing a 27% rise in the value in the last five years, or whether we can say that we can see the glass half empty, taking into consideration the fact that our market share in the overall wine imports remains very meager, very small. My personal point of view in this is that we are doing a, a great job because we cannot overlook the fact that the wine imports have grown significantly, the value has, has grown significantly. But on the other hand, we need to intensify our efforts. We need to intensify our efforts because this is a big and growing market. The market, the overall wine consumption in the U.S. has been growing steadily. Uh, it, uh, 2019 was the only year that we saw a stagnation in the market. There was no increase in the market. We primarily attribute that to the fact that wine, uh, young people do not consume wine as much as the previous generations did. Uh, in any case, the, the truth of the matter is that this is a very, very, very big market and it has a huge potential. And I think we have to build upon what we have already achieved in the last eight years, meaning that we have to intensify the efforts that the Greek wine producers are, 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 are making to, to further penetrate into the U.S. market. Um, as far as the varieties are concerned, I would say that by far the number one variety is, is Asitico. And that is because the Greek Wine Producers Association uh, used Asitico as the spearhead to penetrate into the U.S. market. And that's the reason why this is happening is both because uh, uh, Asitico is, of course, a wine wine and it is more easily consumed. On the other hand, red wines are not so easily consumed in the sense that you need to consume them in a, in a meal, in a lunch, or in a dinner with other people. Uh, white wine, on, uh, on the other hand, can consume by the glass, by just sitting by the glass, by the, by the bar with a couple of friends. So number one wine right now is Asitico, and then, and then you have the other varieties that following suit, like uh, Mavro Daphne, uh, Xinomavro, Agiorgitico, so forth, so on. Uh, one other thing that I'd like to say and, and actually stop at this point, uh, to give the floor to also to other participants and speakers, is that most of the Greek wine right now is being, is being consumed in the food service. By saying food service, I mean, of course, restaurants, bars, clubs, cafes, 
uh, hotels, so forth, so on. And this is the case because um, you have a very strong um, uh, footprint of Greek Americans that are actually own uh, food service properties in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Primarily restaurants, bars, uh, cafes, also hotels in certain regions in the U.S. So this this actually is a very very a fertile ground for Greek wine produce for wine producers in the U.S. to launch their products to to put the products in. So these are a couple of things that I'd like to say and point out to. And of course, I am at your disposal for any questions that you might have to ask. Thank you very much. And I want to thank very much uh, Marcos Drakotos, the president, for a wonderful event. Uh, and also Alexandra for uh, inviting me to be on board. And uh, I'm looking forward to similar very beautiful events in the near future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I, I, I just like to note that uh, Greece is very well represented by yourself and Dr. Putras, as are uh, the Greeks here in the United States. And, and we thank you both for your incredible service. Thank uh, you. No, thank you. I, I just want to um, make note, I saw a friend of mine popped up on the screen, uh, Edouard Bourgeois, who uh, worked with Michael Madrigal, was a sommelier at uh, Cafe Bouloud. So hopefully we'll, we'll get to hear from Edouard as, as uh, we move along. Um, and I just want to mention that we have Anamnesis and Greek News with us, so that's wonderful. Um, so uh, we, we look forward uh, to seeing some wonderful things written uh, about the Greek wine industry. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Andrea, please take us, Mythikas, the nose of the gods. Thank you very much. So thank you everyone for, uh, if, you're, if this is your second time on our journey, um, for those that don't know who I am, um, I'm Andrea Anglisis, one of the principals of Athena Importers, which is um, one of the oldest family owned and operated importers of products from Greece and Cyprus into the US. Um, just a quick note, and I'm not that I'm trying to rush anybody. We do have, I think I've seen all three of our producers that were tasting their wines tonight on with us. So just in the sensitivity of the fact that it's really late in Greece and especially one of them is still harvesting. Um, we're just, you know, we, I just want to be mindful that it's practically midnight there. Um, mm. So that's all I'm going to say on that, but they're Greeks, they go out anyway. So let's begin for those that might not be, oh, well, hold on, we got to get, now I've got to get my thing, there we go. Um, so obviously those for, for to, who don't really understand or know, obviously everybody knows Greece, but you know, this is just a little bit, if you were here last time, forgive me, but I wanted to bring back some of the original slides. Um, in order for some of our newer participants just to understand a few things. Um, you know, as Greece is part of the EU and we are, uh, we have northern land borders only, the country is very much surrounded by sea and it's a huge influence. Just as we were also talking last time together about the, uh, the wines from the islands, even though we are now in the Peloponnese, yeah, Africa, yeah. the, um, you know, water is still a huge influence yeah. in yeah. all yeah. of the yeah. areas that we are talking about. Uh, we do have the 10th largest coastline in the world. And again, that salinity and the minerality is something that we're really going to be tasting as well um, in all of the wines that we have today. So the majority of the country is, you know, we're under the Mediterranean climate and uh, we are a very mountainous country. So as much as everybody always thinks about sun, beach and fun, there's a lot of mountains and there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of wineries and vineyards uh, that are at higher altitudes. And that is what really does uh, set us apart from a lot of other parts of Europe. Now, this at a glance, this is not meant to be a lecture and be boring. I just wanted to tell you that we are focusing on the Peloponnese and Athens today. So those are two of the largest, when you combine them, they represent almost half of the uh, total production of the country. And just because it's more of the most acreage under, land, uh, under vine, um, but that's where you used to see a lot more of the production coming from. Also proximity to Athens where a lot of people lived. So that's where you see a lot of wines that come into this country tend to be from, and that's where we're focusing today. And then, you know, with our wine laws, just for those to get a bit of an understanding, if you're not familiar with the way Greek wine laws work, they are based um, on the French appellation system. So originally, um, because everyone, they thought that when they were, when the Greeks were trying to figure out what situ which appellation system made the most sense, um, they basically said, okay, the French have figured this out after centuries. 
And so the way that they work in, in when you when you look at these labels too and the bottles, um, you will see either they're most of them are, they're going to be PDO, which is protected designation of origin, which is your appellation of origin, and then we have PGI protected des des uh, geographical indication, which if uh, you're familiar with, for example, out of Italy, um, IGT, that is a more regional category. Mm -hmm. One's not better than the other, they're just very different. And of course, when you're looking at your bottles, you will see a few that have the pink strips that are underneath the, uh, underneath the capsule and over the cork, and those represent um, the appellations. So, and that's a numbered system, but I can let the winemakers talk about that. Uh, we do have, as I said, our, our, our wines are basically separated into two quality, into two categories, quality wine and table wine, but don't take table wine with a grain of salt because that is also where there's a lot of experimentation happening. Um, so you see a lot, of, a, a lot of producers that are working outside of the Appalachian parameters are in this table wine category. And so don't think of it as the cheap stuff because there's actually some really interesting stuff that's, grow that's going on in there. And then of course we have the Appalachian by tradition. And today we are tasting a Red Sina, which I'm really happy about because it's actually a really cool one too. So I know a lot of people, especially when you deal with Americans, they think everything is Red Sina and they think that's all we, that's all we produce. But uh, as we know, that's a very small amount of our total production in the country. Um, so these are where our climates are in Greece. We do have three distinct climate types. Mediterranean, Alpine, and Temperate. And we are basically going to be talking about the Mediterranean climate that encompasses the Peloponnese and Attica, where, which is the uh, prefecture where um, Athens is. Now, I have always loved these two maps because a lot of times people don't seem to conceptualize where Greece is in the world of winemaking. And um, so for, your, for those who have friends that might not be familiar with wines from Greece, this is always fun because when you lay the world flat, it's like, okay, if your friends are drinking wines from Southern Italy, from Sicily, from Spain and Portugal, um, we're on the same lines in the same latitude lines. So therefore it is, um, it's not a far stretch for people that like those types of wines to be able to cross over into the world of Greece. And what I always love is this particular slide where Napa is on the same latitude line as pretty much just the Northern tip of the Peloponnese. So not that we, uh, we're not trying to compete with Napa, but what's kind of fun is that when you put the world flat, Greece and Napa are on the same line. So just food for thought on that. And then if you flip the world upside down, you end up in uh, Australia. So let's start first with Athens. I am going to also um, bring in Maria Marku, who is uh, one of the, uh, the family members from the Marku Winery. Uh, she'll also be speaking as well, and then we'll, we're going to be tasting uh, their two wines. So just to recap, we're going to taste first the Sabatiano, and then we will be tasting their Retsina. So everybody has their, whoever has their wines, hopefully they have them open and they have them in glass. So this is where we're going to have some fun. Um, what I always wanted to start with too is that, of course, we have such a huge and rich wine history. Um, you know, this dates back centuries. And it, wine has always been an integral part of the Greek culture of civilization. And there is evidence of wine production dating back thousands of years. Of course, we're the oldest press in Crete. Actually, we discussed that um, in our last um, education uh, educational class. And so this particular influence about wine has been ingrained in our systems. And we always have wine with a meal, for example. It's not that Greeks are really out there drinking wine to get drunk, but it's the fact that there is so much history behind wine in Greece is, um, makes it even more special and unique for us. And then in terms of the modern times, um, you know, a lot of, uh, there have been a lot of changes ever since uh, the wars. Of course, we've started, my parents started in the business in the 1970s. So we've seen the evolution of the Greek wine industry from after the wars to today. And it's been fantastic. It's a very, it's a very um, interesting thing to have lived through, even for me, um, because I came involved in, um, in 1997 full time. So the wineries, though, that we are going to be talking about today have been established. Actually, we have with us today, and of course, Labis is at the end, um, one of the oldest wineries in Greece since 1864. But right now we are going to start in Atiki in Athens and uh, talk about Sabatiano, which is a great variety that 
for decades and even up until very, very recently was always just kind of, I don't want to say looked down upon, but I don't want to say, I think it was just really not very well understood because it's a vigorous grape variety. And it's a grape variety that if you're not very careful in the vineyards can yield wines that are just okay. So you really need to have work in the vineyards, um, careful attention to detail and also work with their uh, fermentation techniques and also in winemaking in order to have the most um, interesting and unique wines that come out of these grapes, uh, uh, the wines that come from these grapes. And um, I do find that these wines will actually do some, are very interesting with some age on them. So the fact that we're not drinking super fresh is actually for me the best thing ever because um, it shows the potential of what the, um, the are, are for these wines. And what's also kind of cool is that Athens is one of the only, it's pretty much the only city in a, Euro it's a European capital that you can walk to a vineyard if you wanted to. So I don't think there's any other city in Europe that can actually boast that particular, um, you know, little nugget of information. So that's where we are with that. Our terroir. So Atiki has the, um, the mountains that surround it on the northern side that go down into, uh, that end up in a very, like a gently sloping plain that ends up at the water. So you do have a very good exchange of air between the mountainous cooler air and the warmer air from the ocean, from the sea. So you will always have an exchange of air, which is good, of course, because you need that in order to have um, uh, the, the leaves to move. You, you, it reduces the, the um, need for any sort of spraying. There is not that many pests that reside in the Athenian vineyards. Um, so I'm not trying to say everything's natural, but the fact that these are grapes that have, um, have adapted and are used to warmer temperatures and the fact that they, re they don't require as much maintenance on that side is something that is uh, quite in, um, important as well. So the majority of the soil is very chalky. There are some, uh, some clay and loam deposits. So what that will do is also give a minerality as well. Um, and the best Sabatianos tend to be in goblets. So when I will show you some goblets because I have a few of those pictures for us as well. So here is where we are um, in terms of Atiki and Athens and what we're talking about. Um, it's actually kind of cool where, where the Marku uh, winery is. We can actually visit right from the airport if and when we ever get to travel because for those of us that don't have Greek passports, we're stuck here until we can do that safely. So here is the Marku winery. Maria, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi. <laughs> I think we can. Can everybody hear Maria? Okay, cool. I guess so. Okay, so if you would like to start, talk a little bit about the winery and the history and all that fun stuff. Okay, so um, we're a winemaking family. We go back four generations since the, since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, my great grandfather was the first to plant his first uh, Sabatiano vines. Um, they used to make wine back then very modestly, uh, the traditional way. Uh, he would sell his wine in downtown Athens. He, he got to be very popular with his wine all over the Placa taverns. So in 1983, my father and uncle, they founded the, uh, the family's uh, contemporary winemaking unit. This one? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you will be tasting Sabatiano. Uh, Andrea covered very well everything about Sabatiano. And thank you. Um, these are the goblets. How old are these vines? If I'm correct from what Vasily told me, these are the 60 plus year old vines that you guys have outside the winery, right? Yes, yes. You don't, you cannot find um, a lot older vines in Athens because of the phylloxera disease that hit during the 50s, 60s, around there. So most of the vines are the eldest vines. Most of them are 60 years old. Cool. Let me see if I have some more fun pictures. So these are all Sabatiano vines for everyone to see. And as the grape variety, um, Michael, if you want to hop in too at this point, um, what are your thoughts about how Sabatiano is tasting as well? I get those more of like the... Um, you know, a little bit more, not the banana, but like that ripe fruit, I, but I'm getting the acidity and the minerality. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I find it aromatically kind of neutral. Like it's not, it doesn't seem quite aromatic as uh, a lot of other grape varieties like Moscafilero, for example. It's more showing the, the earthy aromas. You know, there's something quite, but also phenolic uh, about the aromas of this wine. It, it, it seems to be more of a sort of a, a phenolic, for lack of a better word, that I get on the aromas. And it's intense wine. You know, I like it. It's, it seems to be very, very sturdy for a white wine. You know, it's got it's got really tight structure, lots of dry extract and very, very, I mean, somewhat misleading. Like you think of it as a simple white wine to drink outside and, you know, not think about it. But it demands attention. It demands my attention when I drink it. And I mean that as a very high compliment. I, I vote, you know, I found that I've um, been tasting older vintages of Sauvatiano and um, it amazes uh -huh. me like even five or six years old they're still vibrant and lively uh -huh. and there's still a lot of acidity and I almost feel bad in the old days when everyone's like ah Sauvatiano it's not a grape that's going to be able to um, you know develop and I think it got a really bad rap for a long time um, <laughs> and I think that it, you're able to see now that there is the, that the phenolics yes it makes it a little bit for me a little bit richer but with food, this will be. This is a great pairing as well. So that's where it's kind of fun, I think, in that respect. Yeah, I have a question about the as you mentioned, Maria and Andrea. The the soils are very is are somewhat infertile because of the um, the the stones there. Are is it very difficult to grow other grape varieties in in these vineyards? No, it's not, uh, but Sabatiano is, cer is certainly more uh, resilient in these conditions. Uh, most of the other grape varieties are more fragile. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, you can, you can grow, but Sabatiano is the easiest to grow. Right. I, I also think that has to do with the rainfall as well there, Michael, because since there is no irrigation, Mm -hmm. um, in the area. I think a lot of other uh, grapes will get very stressed, whereas some of them adapted well yeah. to the soils there. Um, I mean, I know, yeah, I've we've tasted other ones, but I think that it's just like, this is like, it's, it's, it's like, you know, wheelhouse is to be in the area around Athens. Well, that makes me like this wine even more, to be honest with you, because it's truly a wine of terroir. It's truly the best grape to grow in this region because the vine has adapted to the heat and the hot summers of that region and to be able to survive without a lot of rainfall. You know, it's, it's really one with pl the place, the vine at this point. And also, ha yeah, sorry. No, it's okay, go ahead. No, just, uh, just a, a little information about the grape. Um, it's so resilient, uh, which is, you know, funny for me to mention after mentioning the Philoxera uh, but it's it's very resilient to disease, and it's often used all over Greece. Has always been used all over Greece, um, alongside other varieties to protect them and shield them from disease. So it's also very resilient to disease. And how long Just back has Sabatiano been planted in Greece? Is it like a thousand years? Do they have uh, any information about that? Uh, it's um, it's debatable. It's yeah. considered to be one of the eldest. Mm -hmm. It is, well, Retina, we will talk about Retina afterwards, but it's, uh, it is, the, the, the tradition of Retina goes back um, many, many years, like millennia. Mm -hmm. So, so I know is the grape variety from which Retina is uh, traditionally made from. So. Mm -hmm. It makes sense to just, you know, to think that Sabatiano has been uh, here a long time. Probably, cool. it, it probably has mutated too, but this, I, I, don't, I don't know how far they go back. Maybe, maybe if Leonidas is on, he might know because he's also been involved. We'll, we'll see. We can always find that out. That's a very good question. Mm. Cool. So are we ready to... Delicious. Any questions yeah. from Sabatiano from the group before we move on to Retsina? And don't hold your nose at Retsina, everyone. No, this is great Retsina. This is one of the best Retsinas I've ever had. That's why I put it out there. Yeah. Michael, the amount of time that 
as I said, you know, on the sales side, that people will tell me, and I'm not trying to poo-poo the Red Sea Maria because this yeah. is like the fun, this is a really funny story. Is that everyone tells me, "Don't bring me Red Sea; it's terrible." I have the stuff that you want to clean the floor with. Yeah. I tell them, I'm like, do me a favor. I don't. You don't have to like it, but you have to try it. Because if everyone's going to think, you know, and of course, you know, they think, oh, green wine is Retsina, which we know that it's less than 10% of the total production from the country, at least try a good one. And if you don't like it, I respect it, but you at least have to try one and if it is what it is. And every time I've done that to people, they're like, damn it, I actually like this. So that's kind of fun. That's, that's always been my fun thing with Retsina, just throwing it out in the bag and yeah. going. Um, and, you know, if we're going to embrace the 800 pound elephant in the room, Retsina is a really unique product. And of course, it's only, um, it's only applicable to Greece. That's why we have our appellation of tradition, uh, which means that there is no other EU country that can make Retsina and call it Retsina. Um, and it does date back to the Minoan civilization. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about the amphora, when they were lining their, the amphora with, the, with pine resin, that's how this whole thing started. And then of course, when you bring it into modern day times, when you had the barrels that were coated with pine resin, again, it continued in that particular fashion. Yeah. Um, but as we as we're tasting, Retsina though is super fun. Yeah. This is the food wine because this and a killer curry, it will knock it out of the park every time. You no, know, you know what I think of when I when I smell this and I taste it, I want like <laughs> lamb with rosemary and lemon. <laughs> With like tons of rosemary yep. on on the lamb, flavor. yeah, because I think it would be perfect with that. Now, uh, Maria, could you please talk a little bit about how um, what your the because okay, I, I just want to back it up before I give it back over to Maria. Is that you know in the past we did have a lot of people that produced really crappy white wine, and they were resonating the hell out of it in order to be able to pass it off as Retsina. Right. Um, what we're tasting though, and Maria, you I'm sure you'll hopefully I'm saying this correctly. The same base wine that we've tasted in the 100% stainless steel Savatiano is the same yes, wine exactly. in the Retsina. So we're right. starting with a superior base product before we do anything to it. And I think that's quite important to mention as well. But if you could talk a little bit about how you guys produce the Retsina. Well, um, each producer has his own uh, little uh, fun recipe, let's say. We have uh, my great grandfather's recipe for making Retsina. Uh, you add a specific amount of pine resin in cloth before fermentation and you leave it there for a couple of days and then you extract it and that's it. So it's like making a very large pot of tea. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's like infusion some mm -hmm. <laughs> in some sense. You, you shouldn't put too much, you shouldn't leave it for too long because it, the point is for, for the wine to still taste mm -hmm. like wine and have the additional tones of the pine to complement it. Yeah. You know, Maria, I have to say the grape Savatiano in its somewhat neutrality works as a really great ingredient to the pine resin. It, yeah, it, it's it true. works very well together. That is true. That is a very good point. Yeah. That's such and it, in your, Maria, what do you like Retsina with, personally? Uh, I like uh, fried uh, fish uh -huh. with Retsina, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I like the acidity of the Retsina um, just balances uh, the oiliness of the fried, uh, the great fried fish and the fried calamari, which I have associated in my mind. It's, it's a personal... Sure. Uh, yeah, more personal. You know what's also kind of fun recently? Um, obviously, it's more pre-COVID, but Retsina has started to become a very interesting uh, ingredient in cocktails. Mm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're starting to see more Retsina-based cocktails um, happening. And, you know, places that I never would have thought I would be selling, a, you know, Greek wine <laughs> to, let alone Retsina, it's because the bartenders are finding these, are, are developing these very unique recipes that are that more herbal. Like you were talking about, Michael, with the infusion of, um, of uh, thyme and rosemary, the more mm -hmm. pungent herbs. Uh, this is like a little floater on top has become sure. an interesting uh, thing. Yeah, to, to brighten up the drink. 
somewhat. Exactly. To give it like, you know, elevate the acid. Right, right. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Do you, do you guys think that, is there wisdom in that pairing with, you know, pine resin and white wine? Like, do you think they, they were correct in creating that? Do you think it works to this day? Do you think it's like a universal or at least a Greek sort of flavor, uh, a passionate, passionate Greek thing that this has been invented? Do you see the wisdom of it today? Uh, for me, it's a great match because it's they're, they're two beautiful um, plants. Let's say it's the vine and the pine. They right. rhyme. So um, they really uh, em embody the nature of uh, Greece and Attica mm -hmm. spe specifically. So I think it's a very natural mix, a match, a mm -hmm. very natural match. Mm -hmm. That's cool. When I was, um, I went to Greece a few times and the one time I, I went, I was in, um, was it the Cote de Meloton? And I, w I was in a vineyard and there were pine trees and you could see the vineyard workers cut, you know, uh, cut little notches in the tree to get the pine sap in order to make their homemade retsina. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wee! That could be fun. Do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that is very commonplace for for us growing up in Attica. It's very very commonplace. We grew up with this. A lot of my a lot of people make their own wine, so it's uh -huh. very commonplace. Cool. Yeah, great stuff. This is my first time tasting your wines, Maria. I've never had them before, and I I love. I think they're great, and I I'm interested. What other, do you, do you make red wine as well? Yes, we make a lot of, we make a Yurgitico. Uh-huh. We have uh, vineyards also in the mail. Okay. Actually, we, we have, have um, a biodynamic Sabatiano that's in, uh, that has zero, no sulfites added to a very specific parcel. It's very cool stuff. Yes, we have been exploring Sabatiano extensively for the past uh, 15 years. Uh, we make, uh, a biodynamic, like Andrea said, uh, natural wine without sulfites, which goes very well and it ages. What really has uh, amazed me with Sabatiano is the fact that it ages amazingly. Mm -hmm. And my, I, I have a, let's say, um, a soft spot for older wines. <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm really, really proud and uh, pleased with Sabatiano has amazing potential for aging also. Have you um, ever have you ever made them in oak barrels? Yes, we also have a Sabatiano with uh, oak barrel fermentation for six months. It's called Varelli. As a matter of fact, we have that here. We bring in small quantities. We have, we have the 2016. And are those the ones that you found are that can age well, or is it the stainless steel ones as well? As well. It, it, it brings a to totally different uh, results because there's no oak, let's say, in the, the first one that you tasted. Uh, if you taste the one from 2013, it is an amazing, amazing wine, uh, very mineral, very uh, lots of mushroomy and uh, soils and it's uh, delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, very different, uh, it, it, it really changes, let's say it becomes something else. Actually, you know what the coolest one I've tasted? So this, our partnership with Marku is very recent. I think we're about three yeah. years in now. Okay, um, that's probably why I haven't had it. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's new. Um, I tasted their Cleftes, which is the biodynamic, no sulfites added, um, uh, Savatiano. I want to say randomly, uh, Maria's cousin Vasily, who is the one I deal with on the, on the work side, he pulled out a 2009 and I was like, oh boy, okay, I don't know. And honestly, it absolutely floored me. I had right. never tasted anything like that. And that's actually what changed my whole perception about Savatiano. Right. That's interesting you say that because, you know, we think of the great wine, white wines of Greece. You think of Santorini. You think of Vesertico and Santorini. And when the wines get to that age, oftentimes they're dead. You know, 2009s, oftentimes they oxidize and they can't make it past that point. So I'm interested that a lowly grape like Savatiano 
could could go longer. You know, I think that's also why people, you know, probably a little hesitant with today, because also with Savatiano, yeah. you know, this is a price point that is accessible to everyone. Right. I mean, you're right. talking about wines that I'm not trying to, you know, they're not cheap, but they're not expensive. You're you're looking at under twenty dollars a bottle for a killer bottle of wine mm-hmm. that you can you can drink and you can really appeal to a good majority of the masses. And so um, I find that this is one of these, you know, it's like a, it's a great calling card for us for, for, you know, because people aren't used to it. It is uniquely Greek and um, it, 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 it ticks all the boxes in terms of a retail standpoint too. Cool. You know, any questions from the peanut gallery before we go on? We're good. Okay. Good. Maria, thank you so, so, so much for staying up. Thank with you us. so much for having me. And thank you so much for tasting Please the wine. Please give our regards to the your family and kisses to all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maria. Okay, guys. I hope you enjoy Bye-bye. your... Listen, I know a lot of people probably thought, Retsina, and yeah. so much, you know, Good. but... You know, I hope we're today. If we, if you don't take, you know, if you don't like everything, it's fine. But on the flip side, it's great to try with grapes that you might not think, you know, are in your, you know, are in your everyday um, vocabulary for Greece, mm-hmm. and um, that there is a lot more out there aside from, you know, your 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 workhorses, you know, of your asirticos and stuff. And there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of things to drink that people can really get behind and, uh, you know, enjoy on a daily basis. So. Now we are moving from Athens into the Peloponnese. I know we've all tasted Ayurgitico and Moscofilero before, but today we have a very, very special friend with us. We have, uh, we have Leonidas Nasiakos with us, who, by the way, is still in the midst of harvesting Moscofilero, so you have to excuse him if he's really tired today, because that is a very late ripening grape in Greece. Um, but what's I kind of brought in a little bit on my maps, too. So here we are. We're just going to be focusing here. Um, you know, between when we get towards Pyrgos, that's where Labis is going to be talking for Mercuri. But then we're going to talk now about Mantinia and Nemea. Um, so we can work into the Peloponnese a little bit and talk a little more about grapes that everybody knows, but there's a lot of, de- a lot of uh, there's, def- there's a lot of layers and complexity to these grapes that um, merit t- conversation and discussion too. So Leonidas, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hello, everybody. How are you? How are you doing? I'm uh, Leonidas Nasiakos, the general manager and winemaker of Semele Estate, which was established in 1979. Actually, the first winery of Semele was located in uh, Attica, near Athens, and uh, the main production was based on uh, Savatiano, the local Savatiano, of course, and some uh, a few bottles of international varieties like. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and uh, Chardonnay. But uh, in 2002, Semeli moved to Peloponnese and uh, located and was located from since 2002 and then in uh, Nemea, actually, and Mantinia, two of the main uh, appellations of Peloponnese and uh, Greece, I could say. So the, the the grape varieties that we work with are, of course, Agurgitico from Nemea and Moscofilero from Mantinia. I think that first we'll taste the whites. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, we are uh, uh, we have not finished the harvest yet. We are in the harvest of Moscofilero, which is uh, going to last for four or, f- or five more days. Okay. So first, we will taste the Mantinia, the white wine, based f- or from uh, on Moscofilero. Actually, I'm showing some pictures of the yes. winery in Nemea, yes. just for everybody to see. Yes, that's the winery in Nemea. If you wouldn't mind, just because I know it's it's kind of fun. Like I was just going through all of the fun stuff about the mythology and where Semeli got her name, because that's always a fun one for people if they don't know the that part mm-hmm. of mythology. So actually, uh, yes, uh, the in, in ancient Greece. The Greeks used to believe in 12 different gods. The, the king of the gods was Zeus, who was married with Hera, but at the same time, Zeus had several <laughs> love affairs, let's say. So one of his love affairs was Semele. Uh, uh, sometimes Semele became pregnant from Zeus, and Hera, his wife, learned about the pregnancy 
and because Hera was uh, very jealous, she decided to kill Semele. And how she did that was uh, that she convinced Zeus to appear in front of Semele with all of his uh, power. The thunders, the rainfall, the storms, the winds, because Zeus was the god who was controlling the weather conditions. So that's what he did. He appeared in front of Semele with all of his uh, power, and Semele was killed after that. But Zeus wanted desperately to keep this baby. So what he did was to take the baby out from the belly of Semele and close wrap it in his leg for the rest of the pregnancy. So the baby came out from the leg of Zeus, and the name that the baby was given was Dionysus, the god of wine in ancient Greece. So Semele actually was the mother of Dionysus in ancient Greece. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun to bring in some of the mythology for us. I've got I've got a big painting back here of Poseidon, I think. So yeah. So let's say some things about Mantinea. Uh, actually, Mantinea is located in uh, in the center of Peloponnese, in a high altitude of 650 meters. Actually, it is a plateau surrounded by mountains with very cold winters. The snowfalls, low temperatures. Imagine that during the winter, maybe the temperature go down to 10 minus. Uh, but also Mantinea has uh, cool summer nights. So that helps the ripening of the grapes to process very slowly and to preserve the acidity, the freshness, the crispiness, and all the, the floral character of Moscofilero. So that's why the harvest of Moscofilero takes place in the first, starts in the first week of October and sometimes lasts in the last week of October. Isn't this the, the last uh, white grape to ripen in Greece? Actually, yes. I think there is one more in uh, Patra. Uh, it's, a, it's a grape variety named Sideritis. Mm -hmm. Sure. The last. Okay. okay? Parparusis makes a good one. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So Moscofilero is a pink skinned grape, which gives actually white wines, but also rosé wines, but mostly white or uh, sparkling wines, which have the character of a rose petal of citrus, crispiness, high acidity, and a medium moderate alcohol from 11.5 to 12.5%. Uh, Actually, Moscofilero is a wine which can be consumed all over the year, but mostly from spring to summer and autumn, uh, and can of, of course can match uh, fish, seafood, salads, or could be consumed as an aperitif. Mm -hmm. So that's Moscofilero. Mm -hmm. See the different colors on the of the of the um, the grapes, and so that's why it's really really cool. Where you don't, you know, it's not a truly one color. It's a there's a lot of different things that go on in the vineyards in the vines. Yeah, sometimes it's pink, sometimes it's red. Does it matter the grape? I mean, even though you know the skins are dark, does it matter that the ripeness of the skins for harvest, even though you're not using the yeah. skins for, you're not extracting anything from the skins? Yeah, actually, the color of the skins is a point to to give us the direction how the ripening is going. Right, how the internal ripening is. Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Now that's a good. Uh, that's better than using a uh, a computer, I guess. <laughs> yes. Cool. So we're, now we're tasting the Mantinea for everyone. If you're on, uh, you're on with us to to share the um, you know in the line. We are now going to taste the uh, the Mantinia. I think uh, the, the Mantinia of 2019, Andrea, or no? Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's so pungent. You know, that's always a very typical uh, characteristic of Mosquito Filaro, I've found. You know, very, very aromatic. You know, uh, lots of intense aromatic DNA that comes from that grape. And it's, uh, I love the way it smells. It's, it's almost like aromatherapy. It's very pleasing, you know, the, the rose petal, almost like ginger type aromas that 
are so pleasing on the nose. You Thank give you. A bit of that white, not say white pepper, but yeah, you know, I'd say so too. Very definitely pepper. Just something just on the oh, 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 obviously oh, oh, really still, you know. Yeah, so it's it's really it's it's gonna this will develop and and this is just the everyday stainless steel version of the Mosco Filaro that Leonidas makes. So this has time to I think you've got at least a few more years on this and then it'll get a little more interesting as well as it as it ages. Um, Leonidas, could you talk a little bit about the vineyard uh, site that this comes from from Zevoglatio? Uh, what's your soils like in your vineyards? For uh, actually, mostly the soil is clay. Okay. okay. Uh, the vineyard is state owned, of course, uh, or the vineyards, uh, which are in an uh, age of between uh, 25 to 30 years old. Okay. So, appellation of Mantinia includes 18 different villages. One of them is Zevolatio, which actually is the main, the main uh, area of uh, vineyards in Mantinia. And uh, in my opinion, gives the most intense character and typicity of the variety. That's why our vineyards are located in this special uh, area of the Volatio. Super cool. Yeah, good. Cool. Is, how much is elevation vital to make good Moscofilero? Uh, actually, the elevation in Mantinia starts from 620 meters and lasts up to 650. And I think that this is the ideal elevation to yeah. produce wine with typicity. Can you make good Moscafilro without elevation on a flat sort of valley floor, for example? No. No. But I also think totally the alcohol different. Too. Right. You know, I think also the ABV needs to stay low for it to be really, because otherwise it turns into a perfume bomb. Personally. Right, sure, sure. You know, for me, it's like anytime I see Moscofilero, like a cheap one that's on the shelf, it's like 13, 13, 2, 13, 5 ABV. That's like you just, you walked into like an Abercrombie and Fitch. And right. You <laughs> yeah. right. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, like I, for me, like 11 and a half to 12 percent is the sweet spot for a good Moscofilero. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like really going back to the idea of Greek wines, you know, there's not many places on earth that have warm climate proximity to the ocean and high elevation sites. And that's really the magic of Greece. And you can't grow grapes like this in many parts of the world, especially where you get 12% alcohol or 12 and percent alcohol. It just doesn't happen normally. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And imagine uh, that in Mantinia during the summer, maybe uh, we, we will have a temperature uh, during the day, we'll have temperature of 35, 38 centigrade. Wow. Wow. And during the night, Temperature is going down to 18, 15. Mm -hmm. Imagine that you have 20 centigrade difference of the temperature between day and night. Yeah, that's wild. It's very critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good stuff. I mean, that's that's why I think you also are able to, it, it, it just slows the ripening process down. Right. So but really that's why you have an aromatic wine like this while at the same time high acidity and very fresh. Yes. That's it's because of that. Yeah. If there's no winemaking involved there. That's all the 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 place yep sure. mm -hmm. going back and then how far uh leonidas are the vineyards from uh water i mean so therefore do you find that there is the sea influence from the is there a breeze that's no. there? because you're at the plateau it's really just fresh mountain mm -hmm. air for the, uh, the plateau is all um actually is surrounded by mountains it doesn't have any influence from the sea interesting okay look at the yeah. minerality and the salinity great Cool. So shall we move on to the Nemea? Mm -hmm. Nemea. Uh, Peloponnese again. Nemea, another PDO, another appellation of Greece, uh, which uh, has the main variety of Aeurgitico. Aeurgitico in Greece means St. George, the grape of St. George. And uh, that's because Nemea, many years ago, I think 200 years ago, uh, was named St. George. That's why the, the grape variety has the same, the same name. Um, and the myth says that, uh, that actually um, the wine of Ayurgitico, the red wine of Ayurgitico, um, is compared with, um, is being called the, the, the blood of Hercules. Oh, yes. Because 
Hercules, who was a semi-god in ancient Greece, was uh, told by the gods to, to do 12 different achievements. One of the achievements, that's the myth of Hercules, was to kill the lion of Nemea. And that's what he did. He killed the lion, and the, the, that's, what the, that's why they say that the grape, the, the red wine of Gaiurgitico, is similar to the blood of Hercules. So in the true, okay, in reality now, Nemea actually starts from an altitude of 280 meters and lasts up to 850. So in all these different uh, elevations, uh, soils, microclimates, the same grape variety, the Ayurgetico, can produce different styles of wine. Rosé wines or fresh, fruity, easygoing red wines or red wines to be aged, sweet or medium sweet. So actually is a versatile variety. Uh, I don't know if you remember the first picture, one of the first pictures, which shows the, the winery. Uh, when I don't you want to see I can get back without this making okay, everybody dizzy. Yeah, yeah, thank you. No problem. There we go. That's the winery. So if you look behind, uh, you can see, uh, maybe you can see the sea. That's the Corinthian Gulf. Oh, okay. That means that the sea breeze impacts and influences the, the grapes and the vineyards. That's why the grapes in Kuti, Kuti is a subregion of Nemea. It's the village where the, the winery is located. So Kuti is considered as the highest okay, quality vineyards of uh, Nemea appellation. And that's because um, we have the altitude from 550 to 600 meters, but also we have the influence of the sea breeze. And uh, that's why the grapes are ripening uh, very well and also keep the acidity. Yeah, that's super cool. Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your altitude there, Leonidas? 600 meters. 600. Yeah. And your soil types, because I'm seeing a lot more stone up there. Because I, you know, also with depending where you are in the Appalachian, if I remember correctly, the uh, the valley has more clay, and then the further up you get on the slopes, you have a more like a rockier soil. Is that right? No, limestone, actually. Here uh, we have uh, limestone mainly in Kuti. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oops, wrong way. Okay, let me go back to where we were. So I don't, I don't, I'm trying not to get anybody dizzy. I apologize if I am. Look away for two seconds. Okay, so these are some of the vineyards, myths, Ayurgitico, the grapes. Mm -hmm. So we are tasting the Semele Nemea Reserve at this time. Um, can you also just talk a little bit about what reserve means on the label? Because here in the US, it can mean something very different if it's a California winery or American winery versus what mm -hmm. you're talking about in Greece too. Actually in Greece and all, and all over European Union, reserve means a wine that, is a PDO wine, of course, and he has to be aged for uh, 24 months, at least 12 months in oak and six months in the bottle. The rest of the six months uh, until the 24 depends on what the winemaker wants to do. Maybe barrel, uh, oak, or um, tank, or bottle. But totally, a reserve wine has to be a PDO and to be aged for totally 24 months before release. Mm. On the other hand, Grand Reserve needs 48 months of aging. At least 18 in oak and 18 in the bottle, but totally 48. So, okay, so where, let's start, let's start everyone, uh, if you have your, uh, your Nemea Reserve, if you wouldn't mind tasting some and um, Let's talk a little bit about what Ayurgitico, of course, there is a lot, there have been, there are a lot in the market here, yeah, but um, there's a lot of different there are, versions, you know, yes, there's so many. Yeah. Cause some taste like Pinot Noir and some taste like more Merlot, you know, they, it really has a wide sort of palette of profiles. Well, actually, uh, I can say that this is the advantage of, of Ayurgitico, but yeah. also it's a disadvantage because um, somebody who wants to, to, to sacrifice what Agurgitico and Nemea is, uh, it's not so easy. 
because mm -hmm. you, you, you can see many different styles of Nemea or Ayurgitico. And it depends on the elevation, on the soil, on the microclimate, on, on many different conditions. Mm -hmm. So that's the characteristic of Nemea. Mm -hmm. It's a versatile variety, of course, but you cannot say that there is only one style of Ayurgitico, only one style of Nemea. You will see different styles. Yeah. I like this style, I have to say. I think it's approachable. I mean, it gives yeah, people it's... a lot of, you know, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of complexity there, even though it's still young, but it has the, the acidity there to let this become, develop further. Yeah, so... it's, it, I agree. You know, you look at the color, it's translucent. It's very see-through, very reminiscent of Pinot Noir, very aromatic. And what I like about this is that there's an intensity to this wine. At the same time, it's very elegant. It's not heavy where yeah. you can tell that, that comes from a great vineyard site. You know, that's high, that's the high elevation coming through in the flavor of this wine, where it's deep, but also very fresh. And that's something not many places can pull off. And then the oak treatment that you use as well, Leonidas, you're not very, it, these are not very oaky wines. So you're actually able to taste the grape variety, which I think is also really cool too, because I know I'm not a huge fan of a lot of oak on my reds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, we give priority to the typicity of the, of the grape. Yeah. Super cool, super mm -hmm. cool. Excellent. Do we have any questions from our peanut gallery out there, just out of curiosity, for Leonidas? Any questions? Michael, do you have anything else, any questions or anything you'd like to uh, share? I'm just thinking about, you know, the, the finish of this wine and it's quite long mm -hmm. and it's really, uh, it's a, it, I, I, I'm imagining a lot of great food pairing things with this okay. where, and, and, and forgive me, Leonidas, I don't want to compare your wine to other wines, but it's, it's just, I mean, in order to sort of create a, an idea for people who, who have had these other wines, like, it's almost like a Nebbiolo style where it's, it's got a lot of grip on the finish. It's really, it's got this really delicious chewiness that you could pair food, a lot of different foods with. Oh, yeah. You know, you could, it, I could, I could see you doing fish and chicken and lamb and a lot of different dishes with this wine uh, because of its intensity as well as its lightness, but also its firm chewiness on the finish. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's an easy wine to pair with food, I'd say. I, it's, I think you can you can really you know it, it can span um, a meal. You could even do this with like with a, a nice salmon as well too. I, you could even go with like a heavy a heavier fish. Yeah. Um, Leonidas, out of the in your experience too, Ayurgitico and your style has the ability to age. So this is something that how how many more years do you think like a 2016 of the Nemea Reserve would be? Um, you, do you feel it's at its peak? Do you think it's still at the beginning? Um, thought. Uh, um, I can give 10, 10 years totally from the vintage, which means for six more years, it's going to be fine. Wow. For sure. The 2016, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure. Super cool. Thank you very much. Thank, and I know, I know you're exhausted, Leonidas, and I thank you so much for staying up with us today because I know it's late for you and you have to get up probably like three hours and harvest again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions before we let Leonie this go to sleep? <laughs> okay. It was good to see you, my dear. Thank Kisses. you, Leonie. Bye-bye. Thank you. Excellent stuff. Thank, you. Thank you. So I hope that, you know, now we have also been able to educate everybody. Now, you know, these are some of the main grape varieties. Now we're going to a really cool part of the Peloponnese. Not that I don't love where Leonidas is in Nemean Mantinia, but for me, the Western Peloponnese has like a very special place in my heart. I've always loved going to visit, and this is probably, you know, like some of the, my favorite people. No offense to everybody else I work with, but I love these people. Um, we're going to go now towards ancient Olympia to Mercuri. And this is a really, really fun part of Greece because people know it, but they don't know it. And I actually, this is for me just like a, play, a, a, a part of Greece that you just go there and your stress just goes away. So I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, today we have fourth generation Labis Canalokopoulos with us. And he's going to be speaking about uh, his family's vineyards, which are, and the winery, which is 
if I'm correct, Labis, the oldest family-owned winery in Greece since 1864. So, where's Labis? Hey, hey, Andrea. How are you, darling? Uh, can I be heard? Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. yeah perfect. Uh, first of all, thank you for, for the invitation. I'm glad to be here. Andrea, it's always lovely to see you. And uh, talking about Mercury Estate, it's, uh, it's actually the second oldest uh, Greek winery. Uh, it's 1864, a higher clouds uh, mm. that used to be in Patras uh, was a little bit uh, earlier established. And uh, it's still, uh, I think it's the oldest still running because it's, it remains in the family since uh, 1864. And actually I'm the fifth uh, generation. Oh, so it, than you are, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's fun. And we are located in the uh, western coast of the Peloponnese, which is uh, this place that you can see on the, on the slides. It's, uh, it's a nice place and uh, it's really, really close to the sea. So the, the winery is actually a, uh, a big, extensive part of land that uh, it's really close to the sea. It's quite uh, on the ocean. And uh, it's, uh, it's a plateau uh, with uh, an altitude of uh, 50 meters uh, approximately. And all the vineyards are resting on top of uh, this plateau and are highly uh, affected by the breezes of the sea. I'm sorry uh, to interrupt you one moment, but we've, we've all decided that we're moving to yes. your place. Just so you <laughs> expect a bunch of us to show up at your door. And sometime you, you are very welcome, beach, very welcome. The best! I'm telling you. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a nice place, indeed. It's a, it's a good visit. Yeah. It doesn't suck. No. Uh, th thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> and you're all welcome. All welcome. <laughs> Once the, the planes will be uh, fully running. I know. So, yeah, it's, uh, we're living in uh, sometimes weird times. Uh, I was telling about the family story. Uh, five times, five generations. The first uh, generation, uh, Theodore Mercury. Theodore Mercury. Uh, he was a, a guy that uh, had uh, roots in the area, not where the estate is right now, from a village that was uh, uh, in the Highlands. And he was a merchant. He had the chance back then to visit uh, Italy and dealing with cotton merchants to make money and to deal with uh, the culture of winemaking that the Italians did have a long time ago, uh, the Greeks. So he, he was highly uh, affected by uh, the Italians, the, the winemaking, and uh, when he decided to come back to Greece, uh, he took with him uh, uh, some bunches of, uh, some cuttings of the Refosco grape variety and came to the place where Mercury is right now and planted them and created his business. So the business kept on going since then. Uh, Leonidas Mercury, his son, uh, was the next generation. My grandmother and her sister, the third generation that ran the winery up until the 1960s. My father was the one to renovate, uh, do some major work in, uh, in the winery, uh, reconstruct some buildings. And now it's the fifth generation that cooperates with the fourth to uh, that's his dad with the purple around. shirt. That's yes, that's that, that, Yeah, that's what a that. nice, what a nice guy, your father. Oh, my God, the best. <laughs> oh, uh, love them. Sweet man. Yeah. And the peacocks. So, oh, yeah, the yeah. peacocks. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like you go to the. It's like the Smithsonian Smithsonian Museum, the, the yeah, winery. It's, it's, that uh, house actually, uh, Labis, would you just mind talking about how when your aunt lived there? Remember, I'd never gone into the house until your aunt passed away, and that was like the craziest place I've ever walked into. With yeah, that's the old the old villa. That's the feet. Yeah, it's uh, it's this is the you can see it. This is an old photo, quite old photo, uh, and it was the old mansion that the the family used to stay. It was inhabited up until five six years ago, and it's 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 not a typical Peloponnesian. Uh, uh, architecture definitely so it's uh, <laughs> it, it adapts on, on the on the uh beauty let's say of the, of the, of the it, so it's the best place ever oh there they are that's Kirio Christo, yeah. Kirio Vasili. Yeah. Yeah, so on the, on the slides you can see the the fourth generation mm -hmm. uh, sharing uh two wines the one of of which we will taste today so uh, coming to uh nowadays uh the estate grows uh uh, around 13 different varieties, uh, 
All of them except one, which is the one that we are going to test first, Rovitis, are cultivated in our self-owned uh, vineyards and uh, making certain different uh, cuvées of interesting, I think, and uh, nice wines. So I think we'll start with uh, Foloi, which is our uh, Rovitis. Yeah. And uh, as I told you, it's the only variety, Rovitis is the only variety that we do not uh, grow in the estate. And the reason is that uh, Rovitis is, uh, gives its best results uh, when cultivated in, uh, in the highlands, in mm -hmm. uh, high altitude vineyards. So as you saw from the picture, the estate is not one of them. And uh, when Foloi, which was our first white wine, came in, in the market around 1990s, we wanted to explore this specific variety because it's uh, maybe the most uh, typical Peloponnesian wine variety. Uh, it's actually the second most cultivated white variety in uh, Greece. And uh, although we couldn't uh, cultivate it in the estate, we decided to cooperate with uh, no more than four or five growers that we still deal with up until now and take the best uh, quality of uh, the grapes we could find. So the vineyards are located in three different areas, uh, in uh, the highlands of uh, Ilia, which is uh, uh, half an hour, 40 minutes uh, drive from the winery. And uh, the region is Foloi. Foloi has a, an old, old collection of uh, connection with uh, winemaking. There is a, Talking about Greek myths as earlier, there is a myth again, a Greek myth again connecting. You have to talk about that with the label so people know what, they're la what the label is. I'll come to that later. I'll come to that. Reminding you, that's all. Yeah, and uh, if the other vineyards are, uh, can be found in uh, Egio, which is uh, close to Patras, and it's the PDO zone of uh, Rovitis. Rovitis is a PDO uh, variety when cultivated in the region. Uh, altitude of the vineyards starts from 500 and goes up until 800 meters and 900 meters in the in, in AU region. And honestly, it's uh, the best quality of uh, Rovitis can be found. Rovitis is a pink skin variety, again, uh, close to Mosophila, as you saw in the, in the picture. Uh, beautiful vineyards uh, in the highlands, highly affected by the sea breezes because especially in Egeo, uh, the vineyards are uh, really, really close, although high in altitude, really, really close in the Corinthian Gulf. So they, they are highly affected by, by the breezes. Uh, pretty much uh, biological treatment, uh, no irrigation vineyards. So it's beautiful fruit that gives uh, really nice results as far as acidity, uh, freshness and uh, expression is uh, concerned. Uh, around 10 years ago, we decided to enhance a little bit the Rovitis aromatics with uh, the addition of Viognier and they give a little boost in uh, aromatics, but also in the, uh, in the structure of the wine. So this is how Viognier ended in the blend. Viognier is just the 10% of, uh, of the blend. Uh, we didn't want to alter the Rovitis character, which is uh, what follows is about, but uh, rather than give a, a small highlight, both in the aromas and the structure, and I think it, it really works in, uh, in this percentage. Uh, we're talking about a, a, a stainless steel fermentation, uh, classical white fermentation with cold maceration, and uh, I think we're getting in characteristic uh, Rovitis with the touch, with the Viognier touch. Let me tell you, I've got the 2019 and the acid is through the roof on this thing right now. Oh my goodness, it is so zippy. It's wow. quite, yes, it gives such freshness and this uh, zip effect yeah. in a way. Whew. This has always been, yeah, got? this is, you know, my first trip to Greece was in 2009. And that was the, the, the memory that I kind of remember most was visiting uh, Mercury. And very nice view. You seriously, you know, of course, Santorini is a very strong memory too. Uh, but, <laughs> but visiting your family's estate was incredible. 
And Foloy has always been my go-to inexpensive Greek white wine. And I would buy it every vintage and have it on the list at the restaurant that I was working at at the time. And because it's, it's flavorful, it's, it's fresh, it's, it's not too concentrated. It's like easy drinking. It's just exactly. a That's really great wine. It's a really enjoyable wine to drink and has all the, the aromas and freshness and, you know, sim simplicity in a good way. You know, it's not I, too, it's not too serious. We don't need everything so serious. Right. No, that's the concept about the wine. It's that it's a wine that can go nicely with um, aperitifs, with uh, fried dishes, with salads, can go by its own. It's, it's a fun wine and it's a wine that can be enjoyable during summer, during hot days. So before we move on to the red, can you just talk about the label a little bit? Because I mean, you should see the stuff I get. People think it's a praying mantis or a locust. So I think it's just kind of fun just to talk briefly about the label before we go. Yeah, on. a few words. It's, uh, first of all, it's an art painting of a um, prominent, uh, famous uh, Greek painter, which is, his name is uh, Yanis Adamakos. And it's uh, what I was talking about, the depiction of uh, the old myth. Uh, so in, briefly, uh, Foloi takes its name from Pholos. Pholos was the uh, king of the centaurs. Uh, mm. According to the myth, so Pholos had a pre as a king, you know, had a very precious uh, jar where he kept his uh, extra special wine. So uh, he once he uh, invited uh, Hercules uh, to celebrate, and uh, they opened the wine, and the rest of the centaurs were really mad, and so a war started. Uh, on the one hand, it was. Hercules and Follows, the king. On the other hand, it was the, the rest of the centaurs. And this painting, if you pay a little attention, is uh, the depiction of Hercules on the right and the centaur on the left fighting uh, over a jar of wine. That's the story <laughs> pretty much. How do you guys like the fact that I brought all this mythology back to the roots over here? You see, we had a little bit of education too. It's so much fun. But yeah, Greece has a lot to do with uh, mythology and uh, always in mythology, one of the basic themes was wine. No? This is so tasty. This is a, honestly, so for those- every year, every year, this wine is good. It's just, it's just yeah. happiness in a bottle is all I can say. It's yeah. happiness in a bottle. All right. Thank you, Labis, for that one. Now let's talk a little bit. And Fosco is not traditionally a Greek grape, of course. The one clone's named after the family, so I think that's pretty cool. Let's wow. talk a little yes. bit about Refosco while we get ready to have our uh, our estate red, please. Yes. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Refosco was uh, introduced uh, to the estate. Uh, it was it was actually the first variety that was planted in the estate in eighteen seventies. So uh, there is a long connection. Although Refosco does has its roots and uh, its origin in uh, Friuli, in exactly Friuli, in yeah. uh, northern Italy, mm -hmm. uh, that was the region where Theodore Mercuri, the uh, establisher of the estate, uh, lived for some years. Mm -hmm. And this is where he met Refosco, and probably because it was a, it's a really uh, you know it's, it gives. As you can see in the photo, uh, the, the, the grapes are pretty fascinating. Uh, they are big, they are colorful, they are uh, quite uh, uh, interesting to look. So, uh, yeah, probably he was... Tannic uh, usually, right? They're usually tannic yes, grapes. Yeah. Yes, tannic grape and uh, uh, with high acidity as well. Mm -hmm. So he brought it to the estate and we cultivated it since then. Uh, and as you can imagine, uh, a grape that has uh, been cultivated for over 150 years, has altered its character and has uh, adapted itself to, to the climate, which is totally diff different than Friuli. You know, it, we are uh, in a warmer place, uh, oh, uh, less uh, rainy, probably uh, far warmer during summer. Sure. So it's interesting how it has created a clone after uh, so many years of uh, cultivation in the, in the winery. And... Uh, Actually, in the Greek uh, wine law, it can also be found as uh, mercureico, meaning the mercury uh, grape, because it, you know, back in the day, they used to give cuttings to the farmers and nobody knew about Refosco, everybody knew about taking from mercury. So eventually the name came from there. 
So it's a, it's a long cultivation. We are really, really proud to still have a really small parcel of land that uh, has some of the initial mm-hmm. grapes uh, planted. And uh, uh, the rest are uh, grapes that were planted around 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago. Uh, the when, ones that you... Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. You, can't this become PDO eventually? Eventually, when uh, the thing about PDOs we can be discussed again in Greece, it might become, you know, but... Uh, it should be. Yes, it's Greek law and if, if this... <laughs> Yeah, these things take a long time to, uh, yeah. in Greece. It's no, no, no easy things, especially things that have to do with uh, bureaucracy are usually slow in Greece. Michael, Lapis <laughs> might be in his walker by then. You never know. Maybe then, yeah, the, the eighth but generation if might. If there's a make clone, it if there's a clone of Rafosco named Mercury, that's your first step, right? Yeah, it's pretty. That's, yes, that, that gets you close. Yeah, we're, it's close, not, not that close, but still close. It's on the way. It's paving the path. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's fun, it's fun, but uh, hopefully... And that's when the big bucks come in. Once <laughs> hopefully that it can be discussed again. <laughs> we'll get there. And then we so, have Mavrodafne. Exactly, yeah. We, uh, as, besides Refosco, there's Mavrodafne. So it's a, it's a blend. This wine that we're going to taste is uh, 85% Refosco and uh, 15% Mavrodafne. And uh, Mavrodafne is a very, very significant Greek variety. Uh, it might be known, especially to the older ones, as a variety that gives uh, uh, sweet wines. Yeah. But that's not the case here. And uh, that's not the case at, in the estate since 1960s, when it was initially so you planted. Know, we did from Kefalonia in our last session. So, yes. so, oh. so you know, we did that one. Beautiful, beautiful. So Mavrodafne is uh, PDO in uh, the zones of Kefalonia and the zone of Patra. And Mavrodafne does have two major clones, uh, from uh, which the Tigelo clone, which is the one that we use and everybody nowadays use, has prevailed and uh, considered to be the it's considered to be the most uh, uh, quality one. Uh, I was talking about the introduction of Mavrodafne uh, at the estate, which happened around 1960s, when um, uh, an uncle of my father uh, had the idea, he was a chemist, and he had the idea to use Mavrodafne uh, in the blend of the, in the Refosco wine that we were making to uh, use it as a variety that could uh, help and uh, showcase the, the wine even more. So uh, the story about Mercury Estate and Mavrodafne goes back to uh, from 1960s and uh, Eventually, by the years, Mavrodafne was uh, recognized as a variety that could do amazingly good uh, dry wines. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that we are still in the beginning of this uh, uh, root of, of this era of Mavrodafne. Renaissance for this grape, because like, like a Sabatiano in the beginning where that always got a bad rap, Mavrodafne got a bad rap for a long time too. We're being like- Exactly, exactly, because, because it was connected with, you know, sweet wines and- Cheap wines, cheap sweet wines. Uh, not to, uh, I don't want to say that uh, Mavrodafne can't do beautiful sweet wines. It can do be- amazingly good sweet wines. But uh, usually when it, uh, things are getting cheaper, quality drops. So it had a bad reputation in many ways. And it was, uh, it was beautiful that it was rediscovered in a way as a dry variety. And uh, it showcases uh, beautiful wines that have structure, have tannins have uh, dark fruit aromas and this is I think what it gives to the Refosco as well. So you get a wine that has on the one hand the acidity and uh, the tannins of Refosco with the uh, red fruit when it's young and on the other hand Mavrodafne which is a small amount gets and helps the structure, uh, gives some tannins and uh, give this leather chocolatey aroma that will be even more noticeable when the years uh, pass and the wine ages. And I will say, because I have tasted back, anytime you can get your hands on older bottles of the Mercuri Estate Red and their Cava, oh my, OMG yeah, is all I, I have agree. to say. That I these, agree. these are babies. We shouldn't be drinking 2017 right now. It's a crime against humanity, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, yeah, so- I mean, I, I would even go as far as to say this is one of the great red wines of Greece. Uh, with without a doubt thank you yeah it's true you, it's, it's so particular to yeah. your estate no one else makes wine 
quite like this. So I for think those that the collectors get some yeah. and sell it. Yeah. It has created, in a way, it's uh, a very, very specific character. And uh, I think that the varieties have blended really, really nicely together. And through the years, you can see that there is uh, typicity. And uh, honestly, what you were taking was really, uh, it was true. And uh, I really recommend uh, that this wine should be aged because uh, mm -hmm. it really evolves in the, in the bottle. And uh, mm -hmm. it's supposed to age. But uh, still, you know, you can have it also uh, pretty much that's the story it, it ages 12 <laughs> months in uh, in oak uh, we don't treat it heavily with oak so uh, the oak is second and third use uh, and uh, we try to have the red fruit and the, the you know the varietal characteristics prevailing in uh, in the wine mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's pretty much question. we have a question from our group from yes. Peter Haigas asking, can Refosco be aged and for how long? Uh, we're talking about the, the specific variety, just oh, Refosco. Oh, actually, Peter, no, your wine. Are we your talking wine. about oh, oh. The red or, or Refosco from, the, from Mercuri in, in this yes, particular uh, blend? So this, uh, this blend can, uh, we suggest, we want to be on the safe side always, we suggest eight to 10 years, but mm -hmm. it can really easily go so You're being over, modest, over I mean, this is like a 15 year bottle and some and so it, can, it can do but <laughs> we will try to be on the safe side and both this one and Cava's uh, as well can can cover can go even more so it's, uh -huh. uh, oh, let's see hold on we have i see a question coming through let me see what's going on here oh okay yes he says he says thank you okay. thank you thank you so do we have any more Super. I mean, and these are just obviously we're scratching the surface so anything you see from mercuri the wines are amazing and uh, so I know I don't have a picture to show you, but when, when Labis was referring to the self-rooted vines that they do some very small production wines, those are the faces, as I call them. That's your, Labis, that's your aunt, your grandma, and your great uncle, right? On those one, on that label? Yes, 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 exactly. So those three wines, they're very, very small production, and we get a little bit in every, you know, every year or so. Um, those are from the 1864 vines. So if you find one on a list, I suggest you grab it. It's a, uh, it's a pretty interesting vine yard and it's, oh, yeah. uh, miraculously it has, you know, survived, uh, phylloxera and, uh, we still, you know, it's our, uh, a little gem. Have you finished harvest or are you guys still going? We, we just ended harvest, uh, and we now considering about starting uh, olive oil. Harvest, so <laughs> harvest never ends. No, how was and, uh, how Mediterranean was life? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, you have no. You're you're young. You're allowed. You have to just go for thirty six hours at a time before you sleep, my dear. You don't have to. Oh worry. yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. I do. But it was a it was a great year, an amazing year, and it's uh, it's a pity in a way that this uh, beautiful year is you know connected with the market being a little bit upset and you know, all the COVID situation. We're lining for all the bad news, darling. So that yeah. means that when we're ready to drink it, it's just going to be freaking killer. Mm. But yes, it was an amazing year. The 2020 uh, was uh, so everything clean, no disease. Be oh. Yes, everything. At least uh, at, the, at the estate, at our region, it didn't rain from uh, April up until October. It was super clean, uh, super quality, super quality. Honestly, I can't wait. Although I can, but I can't because honestly, the Foloy is too young right now. I'm actually like pissed that we're going to run out soon, but you know, mm -hmm. it is what it is. But I was thinking that, you know, with all this situation and with COVID, it, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, an opportunity for people to start appreciating uh, older vintages of white, especially, uh, which was not uh, very highlighted by right. when things were normal. So it's, sure, it's sure, interesting. We're okay with things to be a little older in this country. Yes, I'm... It depends where you are, but they're not. So, it's not so bad, personally. Well, I mean, of course not. I think it's uh, you give the time to the wine to mature, to express yeah. itself even, even better. I mean, these are not wines for instant gratification. Granted, you can drink them now and you can thoroughly enjoy them. And I hope, especially when you, uh, when you tasted Mercury's Estate Red, um, if you didn't finish it now with, during this conversation, if you can not finish it today, I'm going to highly recommend that you keep some in your bottle and wait till tomorrow. 
this will be a different beast by tomorrow. And you'll be like, holy crap, why the hell didn't I keep it longer? Um, and I, I think that that's a lot of, um, that's indicative of a lot of the wines. So if you don't finish them today, it's okay. Wait till tomorrow and try them in a few days because this, it kind of also mimics time in, with aging. Exactly. And that'll also be a really good indicator for how long you would like to be able to carry, you know, hold them should you decide to like grab some and sell them because these are all still great values. Mm -hmm. These are not wines that you have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to stock your cellar on. And you're able to have some wines that are just absolutely going to blow people's doors off in like five years. That's the beauty of Greece. Yep. That's the beauty of Greek wines. And the, you know, make no mistake. These wines are, could only pre be produced in their respective areas. You know, there's something really phenomenal about the indigenous varieties and grown on these very unique topo like high uh, hillsides in these areas in the Peloponnese and in around Athens. And these, you cannot recreate these wines no matter how hard you try in any wine region in the world. And that's what makes them really unique and worthwhile and, and worth, you know, spending time and attention to learning about them. This was so tasty. Like I'm, I don't even want to drink that. I have a bottle of what I think it's a 2017. Oh my god, I'm so pissed. We're about to move to 2018, and I'm really kicking myself right now. But it, 17 was a good vintage as well. It was. Yeah, uh, but you know, it's different. It's the fact that you know, it's like this is a baby. This poor thing is yeah, down yeah. and like mature. I hope you know some people that get it are able to to. to to, to mature it on their own cellar. Play this much. There's a few cases going stash in my cellar and I'm not giving it up. So, yeah. as we say, suck it up, buttercup, but that's all mm -hmm. good. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any questions for lobbies? Because for this poor guy, it's after one o'clock. I know if it was normal times, he'd be at the bazooka right now hanging out. No, no. <laughs> but he's got to get up to go to work tomorrow morning. Fourth. Oh, somebody has a question for us. Hold on. Will we be able to continue? Uh, yes. So the question is, can you continue to purchase the wines? And what I will tell you all is, um, even if, let's say, yes, if you, you should be able to from Giannone, but if there is a wine shop that, um, and now I, this actually kind of ties me back to um, opening remarks. You know, th this particular level and caliber of wines from Greece on the retail side struggle and Michael will attest, restaurant is a totally different beast. Yeah. Because you're really pairing uh, food and wine. And that, like, when you're going into a restaurant, you're going for an experience. And when you're going into a retail shop, for many people, I'm not saying for everyone, it's instant gratification. So with a retail shop, the retailer is really going to be very acutely attuned to purchasing and putting things on the shelf that certain people are going to be looking for. So you need to either, if they don't have it on the shelf and it's a store that you frequent, you tell them, I need you to get this wine. This is amazing. That The customer is always right. So if a certain retailer doesn't stock it and they don't want to get it for you, then they should, you shouldn't be shopping there to begin with. But on the flip side, the feedback is if you, if Giannone, for example, is a, a wine shop that you do frequent, you should tell them you are, you are going to become an, a, a, you know, an existing customer for it. Therefore, it creates supply and demand. And especially in this COVID culture, shelf space is at a premium and that they are going to need to know that there is a demand, an inherent demand from the consumer side so they know to keep it on the shelf. So that's very, very um, you know, like important, especially in this, in this particular climate because retail is, is key. But on the other side, they're wines from all over the world are just competing. So we just have to be very vocal in um, in our de not demands, but in our wishes. And if there's a problem, then we think. All right. Anybody else have a, any questions? Michael, any thoughts from you on these on this as well? I'm just happy to be part of this. You know, I love tasting these wines and. You know, uh, like I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, like these are very special and you cannot replicate these anywhere in the world. These are wines of place. And the fact that they're not, you know, abusively expensive is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. 
so. I know that, uh, I hope that, I know we, we, not that we ran late, but I hope everyone was, um, enjoyed our tour of the Peloponnese in Athens today where we got in a little bit of mythology and some really fun characters as well as we learned about grapes that maybe not everyone readily goes to because I think it's important. And uh, thank you, Peter, for the, for the compliment. He said, thank you. He had enjoyed himself. Um, you know, everybody knows certain grape varieties and I respect that and they know Santorini and I respect that. But on the flip side, there is so much more to the country that needs to be um, explored and promoted and um, discussed. And I think that when we talk about wines from the Peloponnese, they're serious, but they're not expensive. Whereas when we were in last time in our previous um, educational series, the wines were more expensive. It's not a bad thing. I think with the fact is that we're, we're demonstrating that Greece has the ability to produce world-class quality wines at a price point that is accessible to many. And if you really want to go out there and you want to spend the money, you can. But the fact is that we have these uh, wines that are available to a very large part of this consumer market in the United States but they just need to be educated. And it's all back to education. That's why we do this. I mean, I could sit here and talk until I'm blue in the face about it, but until people understand that there are grapes out there aside from Cabernet Chardonnay and Merlot and they don't come out of a faucet and they don't taste like your teeth are gonna fall out with tattoos on your fingers like the prisoner, it's gonna take some time. And uh, that's what we aim to do with, uh, with, these, with the series and with things that we do is that we want people to understand the story and to be able to connect with our producers and to understand that wine in this case is not really a commodity. It's, um, it's a labor of love. And the fact that to get wine from the vine here and into your mouth took a long time. And it takes a lot of effort and it's not something that happens overnight. You'll never be a, an a, overnight success. But what we really hope is that everyone that was here today spreads the word because that's the most important thing. Throw a bottle of something, you know, Retsina. People don't like it, get a bottle of Marcru Retsina. Throw it in somebody's face. Dare them to not like it. Put it with the right food. Blind taste somebody on Labis's um, estate red. Can they figure out it really comes from Greece? They might all of a sudden be, oh, I'm such a snob. I only drink wines from Italy and France. I won't even look at Greece. Then good luck trying to, you know, do a blind tasting with it. So I think that there's a lot of value and there just needs to be more um, vocalization is what I would like to say about it. So I don't get all hot under the collar about it. I, you know, I just want to step in here because I know Michael has to go. And I, I Michael, thank you so much. Of course. For really, I, you're probably one of the best ambassadors of Greek wines uh, that exists anywhere. Uh, I'm and, a huge fan, well, obviously. And it's apparent it's because of what Greece does. It's not about me. It's about the wines. We, we can't thank you, that good. Uh, thank you for participating. And just so everybody knows, we, there are two more parts left. There's there's a surprise in the last part, which I won't share right now. Uh, I don't even think Andrea knows. Uh, but I, I also owe an apology to Andrea because when we first started planning uh, these uh, series of wine events, she said to me, oh, you know, I want, I really want to uh, present people with affordable wines. And being kind of the wine snob that I am, um, collecting Burgundy wines and quietly secreting away wines from Santorini because that's where I'm from, um, I, I said to her, no, you know, we, we have a lot of people that, you know, really enjoy good wine and they're going to appreciate, you know, a Price point, and she said, "No, no, trust me." And and hopefully, I trusted her. And every bottle of wine that we open up, and when you think about it, and you look at the price point um, compared to the quality, and 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 you're right, the love that goes into making these bottles of wine, I, they're remarkable. And I thank all the winemakers uh, for all their hard work, their participation in, in these events. And we really can't thank you all enough for everything that you do. And I, I, I hope by having these, um, you know, wine Zoom events that eventually uh, it pays off for everyone and that more people start to learn about the, the quality and the value 
of Greek wines because quite frankly, I, 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 I challenge anybody to go find a, a beautiful $20 bottle of Burgundy wine. Compared you can't do it, can't do it. It, it. It's absolutely not possible. Yeah. Yet you can find a $20 bottle of Greek wine that, that's as good as a $200 bottle of Burgundy. Right. And that's why personally I buy so much Greek wine when uh, uh, at that price point. I never buy Burgundy at that price point. I, it's, I not, may, it's not good. It's, I, it's, I, I may yeah. have said this the first time um, on uh, the first event, but when I uh, first met Michael at uh, Belutsud um, and I saw the menu and all the Greek wines in there, I, I, you know, I, I was so blown away by the fact that somebody with, with so much talent and knowledge was pushing Greek wines in, in such a fine establishment. And, you know, I, I think we owe, as a country, we owe a debt of grat gratitude to you. Um, you know, so we, we thank you. Uh, My pleasure. And Andrea, you know, the, your, your knowledge of Greek wines is exceptional. Uh, we, we were laughing here because we're, we're a few people in one room and uh, we appreciated uh, all the history lessons today. Uh, it just added uh, such a wonderful flavor to the wine event. And, and thank you to Alexandra, because Alexandra really works hard to put all of this together. Um, and, and we re really appreciate all of her efforts. So thank you to everyone. I, I implore people to stay. There's no reason to go. Uh, you can stay and drink and chat if you like. Um, so there's no rush. It, it's kind of like our little Greek wine bar. <laughs> You know, Michael, I'm, you have to go. Thank you. It was good to see you. Thank you, you guys. You Great to see you. Darling. Always a pleasure, my dear. And look Never. forward to the next one. For sure. Thank you, Marcos. Thank you, thank Alexandra. You. Labis, thank I see everybody. you in front of me. You look Honor. good, darling. I don't think you're still on or Maria, but thank you guys so much for joining us. And my mom says hi. She's here. Hold on, Ma. Come back real quick. Hold on. <laughs> Yota wants to say hi. Yota wants to say hello. There she is. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Yeah, Are you in your new place, Andrea? I'm back home finally after 15 okay, months. That's good. <laughs> Why do you think I got Fasianos behind me? I was telling Alexandra. He was one of the first guys to go back up on my wall. <laughs> oh, by the way, we had a question. Do we know if if Semeli was born, um, if Dionysus was born from the left or right foot of uh, Zeus? Oh, I, I can't get that. To, uh, that, that that's no. I, I got nothing. Very good question, by the way. One of, you know what, though? I don't remember there being any sort of uh, reference to that in the mythological um, um, stories I was reading. It didn't say. But you never know. You got to Google it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, kind of Google is, a, is the new god. Uh, but uh, just in case any, uh, most people didn't know, we, we picked the name of this event uh, because the, the highest point of Mount Olympus is Mythikas, which is, uh, th they call it the nose of Mount Olympus. And it was the idea that it's the nose of the gods and the nose of the gods knows what is good wine. And apparently all the good wine is in Greece, thankfully, so. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, it, 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 that's why I tried to work in a little bit of the mythology and the gods, just because it was kind of fun to bring it all back together. and. You know, and then we have all of this fun stuff between uh, Foloy and Hercules and Semele. It's like, why not? We might as well enjoy it. If we're going to talk about it, we might as well talk about the fun stuff too and learn Absolutely. something. Absolutely. And, and, and everybody really look forward to there's something special that's going to come up in one of these events. And I, it's going to just blow everybody away. Oh so boy. We, we I don't know about this either. You better, are you throwing me a curveball? I know we, we, <laughs> we tell you either, but we you you will soon find out. You're gonna find out before everybody else. Yes. I, I better. <laughs> I mean, for the record, you're welcome. You realize that you had you actually had to do eat your humble pie on this one. Mom. I did. I, I, I admitted <laughs> it. I you know, listen, I you know, at least I can admit when I'm wrong. So. That's the right. You see, that I we all want people to understand that there's so much more to Greece and like We've only really started to scratch the surface. And then when we end up in other parts of the country, there is just so much fun stuff out there and things to learn. And the day you stop learning and the day you stop wanting to learn is the day you just, you know, get out of it. It's done. Absolutely. Correct. You're absolutely right. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Everybody. Alexandra, any last minute words? I, <laughs> I thank everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you very much. We uh, really, really um, 
felt uh, wonderful medicimetohisas. Um, thank you, Trade Commissioner. Thank you, Dr. Kutras. Thanks to everyone uh, for joining us and look forward to the next one. We have a few things coming. <laughs> So, well, more importantly, uh, to all the winemakers, uh, it, it's very yeah. thoughtful of you to join us. And we know that it's very late. So again, thank you. And, and absolutely in about a week, we'll, we'll all be in the uh, Mercuri oh, yeah. Estate. We're Greek all going straight to Mercuri Estate. Yeah. Everyone's sleeping on the beach. That's yeah. the right thing to do. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm going to sleep actually in the main house, but you can sleep on the beach. Actually, the beach there has a it has like this crazy like seaweed bed. That's at, isn't that where like Coco Mat started? Like, didn't somebody from Coco Mat get hammered on the beach over there, Labis? Because that's like you sleep on nature. It's one of those things. It, if there's a story there, let, let's hear it. <laughs> well, you know, for me, it's more about like how, um, you know, Coco Mat, sleep on nature. Is apparently, the, you know, the whole story behind what that guy did? Apparently he got hammered and fell asleep on a beach that had all of the seaweed and thought that that was the best mattress ever. So he decided to make the original cocoa mats out of seaweed. Oh, okay. So now you have to get a cocoa mat. Well, and you could probably wake up and eat the seaweed too in case you're hungover. Now listen, at that point, you just, you know, go get some sushi. You're fine. I'll sleep on the beach. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. And we look forward to the next part of the wine series event. Thank so you. Lovers, to, me, to the next part. See you Good all. Good night, everyone. Alimita. And once Adios. again, the packages will still be at Gianone. Cool. Oh, and if not, go to your store and demand they get you wine. Just demand it. That's what we want. Kalinikta <laughs> seolus. Kalinikta, kalinikta. Thank you for joining us. Okay.